Hey guys, welcome back. We'll continue with the book Python for Data Analysis. In this video, we're going to focus on time series data. This is part of a multi-part series, so feel free to subscribe to the channel to not miss any videos. Let's jump right in. Let's dive into working with time series. We're going to start out by learning about date and time data types as well as tools. We will then cover time series basics before we cover date ranges, frequencies and shifting. After that we are going to cover time zone handling, periods and period arithmetic, as well as resampling and frequency conversion. Finally we are going to cover moving window functions. If you want to follow along with the book, you can head over to westmckinney.com book. The link is also in the description down below. Now, time series data is an important form of structured data in many different fields. For example, economics, neuroscience, ecology or finance. A lot of time series are fixed frequency, which means that data points occur at regular intervals according to some rule. So for example, every 5 minutes or every 15 seconds. But time series can also be irregular, without a fixed unit of time or offset between units. Now, how you refer to time series data can depend on the application. We can, for example, work with timestamps, fixed periods, or, for example, intervals of time, or experiment or elapsed time. We're going to mainly focus on timestamps, fixed periods, and intervals of time. Python's Pandas library provides a lot of built-in time series tools and algorithms. To work with time series, we're going to head over to our terminal and then make sure that we activate our IPython environment. We're going to need both NumPy and Pandas, so let's go ahead and let's first import NumPy as well as Pandas. The Python standard library includes data types for date and time data, but also calendar related functionality. We're going to start by using the date time, time and calendar modules. Let's switch back into our own terminal and we're going to start out by importing datetime from the datetime module. We can call the now function which is part of the datetime module and store the result back in our now variable. If you now go ahead and see what's inside of now, we can see that we have a datetime object which reflects the current date as well as the current time. We can also split this up into year, month and day by calling year, month or day on our now object. And as we can see, we then get the specific year, month and day back. We can also take a look at the time difference between two points in time. To do this, we simply can take two different daytime objects with different dates and times and subtract them from each other. So for instance, here we have a daytime in 2011 and we have a second daytime object from 2008. And we are going to subtract our date from 2008 from 2011 and store it back into our delta variable. Now if we take a look at delta, we can see that we have a difference of 926 days and 56,700 seconds. And again, if you want to split this up further, we can call days on delta to just take a look at the individual days. And similarly, we can also call seconds on delta to just have a look at the seconds independently. As part of the datetime module, there's also a time delta object and we can import that and then use it to calculate the difference between two points in time. Let's have a look at that and we're going to start out by creating a new datetime object, which we're going to assign to the variable start. We can then go ahead and add time delta to it and we're going to pass the number of days we want to add to our start date. Now as we do that, we can see that our datetime object is updated. And we now can see that instead of looking at January 7th, we are now looking at January 19th because we added 12 days using our time delta. And here's a quick overview of the different types which are part of the date time module. So we have the date, which is stored as a year, month and day. We have the time and for instance, we have the date time and time delta object that we looked at before. We can also take date time objects and timestamp objects and turn them into strings. Let's have a quick look at an example. Here we have a date time object that we are creating, which we are storing in the variable stamp. And all we need to do in order to turn that date time object into a string is to use the string function and pass stamp as an argument to it. And here we can see we get back a string version of our date time object. 
If you want to have a specific format, for example, the year, then the month and then the day, but not including the time, we can also use a stringify time function instead and calling that in our stamp variable that we created previously. In this case, we would get back a string, but this only includes the date, but not the time as with the string method. And of course, we could adjust the format. So instead of displaying the year, the month, and the day, we also have additional options. So we can, for example, display the 24 hour clock, or we could display the weekday as an integer. Next up, let's cover some time series basics. So basic kind of time series object in pandas is a series indexed by timestamps. Let's have a look at an example. Here we are creating an array of dates, which consists of individual datetime objects, referring to different dates. We can now go ahead and create a new series object by using NumPy's random method and setting our dates as the index. If we take a look at that, we can see that we have the individual dates that we created previously inside of this array. And each of those dates is associated with a random number using the standard normal distribution. And in the background, those datetime objects have been put into a datetime index. We can take a look at that by calling index on our variable that we created previously. And we can see that we get back a datetime index object, including the different dates that we created previously. And of course, we could perform some arithmetic operations. So here, for instance, we can select every second element inside of our object. We can also, for example, index into the first element by using the index function and passing an argument of zero for the first index value. And if we now take a look at the value, we can see that this is indeed the first date that we can also see up here, which is returned to us. Let's next have a look at date ranges, frequencies, and shifting. Now, generic time series and pandas have no fixed frequency. For many applications, that's sufficient, but often we want to work relative to a fixed frequency, for example, daily, monthly, or every 15 minutes. In order to accomplish that, Pandas offers a full suite of standard time series frequencies and tools that we can use. So for example, we can convert a simple time series to a fixed daily frequency by using the resample function. Let's switch over to the terminal and let's take a look at that. We can first of all take a look at the time series object that we created previously. And now we can go ahead and resample those frequencies on a specific basis. So for example, on a daily basis. To do that, we are going to call resample on our time series object. And then we can pass an argument to it. In this case, we are going to pass D, which means that we are going to work with the daily frequency. And we're saving that back in a new variable resampler. Now we can take a look at that and we can see that we get back a pandas object, specifically a date time index resampler object. Now we can also go ahead and use pandas to generate a date range. So for example, here we are creating a date range between April 1st and June 1st of 2012. If you now take a look at the output, we can see that we get back a date time index and here specifically we have a daily frequency. And daily timestamps are the default option that Pandas is working with. We can also go ahead and use our date range method by just using a start or finish date. In that case, we need to provide a second argument, periods, which is going to specify the number of periods by default days that are going to be used with a start or finish date. So in this case here, we are seeing that we have a start date of April 1st, which we specified. And then we have an additional 19 dates. After that, again, the frequency is by default set to be daily. And of course, we can do the same with the end date. So here we are specifying the end date as well as the periods. So if we take a look at that, we can see that the last date specified here is the same as the end date. And then we have 19 additional days displayed here, which are just the day previous to the end date specified. Of course, we don't have to stick to individual days. We could, for example, specify the frequency to be BM, which stands for business month's end, and which refers to the last business day or last weekday of the month. So here again, we specify two dates, January 1st and December 1st. And if we now take a look at that, we can see that we always get back the last weekday of the month. And as we can see, we have a lot of different options available to us. So we saw that we can work with a day as well as a business 
month end value, but we could for example also specify an hourly frequency or for example a weekly frequency. Now in some cases we may work with data that contains data from different time zones. In order to work with time zone information in Python, there's a third party library called PYTZ and we can use it to work with different time zones. So let's switch over to our terminal and let's import that library. And once we've imported it, we could, for example, go ahead and take a look at common time zones. Here we're going to limit that to the first five entries. And if we take a look at that, we can see we get back US Eastern, Hawaii time, Mountain time, Pacific time and UTC. Now we can also get back a time zone object. So here, for example, we want to get back a time zone object for New York. And if we take a look at that, we can see that we get back the specific time zone that we specified. Now by default, time series objects in pandas ignore the time zone, but we can specify it as an argument. So here we again are using our date range method from before. We are specifying a date and then the number of periods. And you're also setting up the time zone, which in this case we are setting to UTC. And if we took a look at the results, we can see that we get back 10 different dates. The default frequency of days is used and we can see that the time zone is set to UTC. Now let's take a closer look at periods and period arithmetic. Periods represent time spans, for example, days, months, quarters or years. And we can use pandas period class to represent these kind of data types. To do that, we can switch over to our terminal. We can simply call period, which is part of pandas. And we're going to specify a date as well as a frequency. And here we are taking a look at the last day of December. Now we can take a closer look at the value and we can see that we get our period class back. And we can use this to perform some mathematical operations. So let's say we want to go five years into the future, P plus five. So now we can see that we have the period here updated to 2016 from 2011. We can also do the reverse. So we can go ahead and we can say we want to subtract two. So in this case, we would get back 2009. We can also convert time steps to periods and back. So let's take a look at an example. Here we are creating a new date range object. We are taking a look at a monthly frequency and we're going to have three periods starting from January 1st, 2000. We're also going to create a time series objects using the series class as part of pandas. And we're setting the index to be equal to dates. So if we take a look at that, we can see that we got back three separate dates here and then we have our randomly generated numbers displayed right next to it. Now to convert those timestamps to periods, we can simply call to period on our timestamp object and save that in a new variable. And now as we take a look at the result, we can see that indeed we have our periods displayed here. So we basically are removing the individual days. Instead, we are just displaying the year and the month which corresponds to the frequency we defined before for our date range object. Now we can also convert a time series from one frequency to another. And that process is called resampling. If we are aggregating higher frequency data to lower frequency, that is called downsampling. And if we are converting lower frequency to higher frequency, that's called upsampling. And we can use resampling to, for example, convert a daily frequency to a monthly frequency or, for example, from a monthly frequency to a weekly frequency. But there are some examples of resampling that do not fall in either category of upsampling or downsampling. One example would be to convert weekly on Wednesday to weekly on Friday because the frequency is still weekly. Now let's take a look at an example. We're going to create a new date range object here with a period of 100 entries. And since we are don't specifying a frequency, of course, the result is going to default to days. To verify that, we can have a look at our dates and indeed we can see the frequency is set to days. So now if you want to change the frequency, in other words, if you want to resample, we can do that by using the resample method. So in this case, we're going to call resample on our time series and we're going to pass m for monthly to our resample method. And then based on that, we want to get the mean value. Sometimes when we work with time series objects, for example, with statistics or for example, stock market data, it can make sense to evaluate data over a sliding window 
Orbis exponentially decaying weights. And that can be helpful to smooth out the data. We are going to focus on these kind of functions, also called moving window functions, and take a look at some practical examples. To do that, we are going to take a look at specific stock market data. And specifically, we are going to take a look at some example data that is also provided with the book resources. So here we are going to use the read CSV method in order to read out our stock underscore px CSV file, which is inside of the examples folder. And we're going to save that in a variable. Specifically, we're going to take a look at three different stocks, Apple, Microsoft, and ExxonMobil. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to resample our data based on business days. Next up, let's actually plot our chart for Apple. And then we're going to call rolling with a value of 250 and take the mean in order to take a look at the rolling 250 day price average, which we're going to plot. Now to display that as a graph, we can go ahead and make sure that we have matplotlib imported. And then we can go ahead and call pyplot.show in order to display our graph. Now when we take a look at the resulting graph, we can see the Apple stock data displayed in blue. And in addition to that, we can see our rolling window graph, which is a 250 day average of the stock price. So it smooths out the individual prices for individual days and gives us more of a general smoother overview. We covered how we can work with time series data in Python. In the next video, we're going to learn how to use modeling libraries such as stats models and scikit-learn. Feel free to subscribe to the channel to not miss any videos and see you guys in the next video.